It's a big part of, first of all, I think it's good to define what we do at Wonderman. And what we do at Wonderman is really looking at data and analytics and combining them with uh, marketing technology to uh, create actions and experiences for our customers, for consumers. So the role of data and analytics, which is the role I'm playing in the organization, is helping everyone use data as the foundation of insights to uncover unique experiences that connect consumers emotionally with brands. And by that connection, creating sustainable, profitable, competitive relationships with consumers. Yes, I think that's a, a very good question. It's also a very big challenge in the industry right now, and you're probably hearing it from other people as well. Is this idea of how do we take observations that we have everywhere across uh, organizations and turn them into insights that can drive action? I think for me, that idea of translating observations to insights is where that translation happens. So unfortunately, it's not an easy thing. And it's not an easy thing because machines can do it. Mathematical equations cannot do it. The only people can do it, basically, and only human beings can do it. So that is extremely difficult. So the, the connector between data and analytics and insights that drive action and understanding across all parts of the organization, from marketing people to service people to salespeople, is insights. And you need empathy. You need to be able to have data people who understand the consumer. They have been on the consumer's place, they have walked on their shoes, they know how the market is. So once you have these people, you can take things that they look you know, disconnected and turn them into insights. I'll give you an example. You have an observation that the people feed their pets when they have breakfast, when they have lunch, and when they have dinner. That's an observation, you can't do anything about it. If you are a data person, you can give that observation to a creative team or to an experienced team. But if you are someone who empathizes, who actually has been in that spot of having a pet, you can take that and say, well, okay, I do this because I do this with my own family. So I look at that pet as being a member of my family. So now if you are a creative person and you look at that observation translated to an insight that people do those actions in a very programmatic way because they see pets as part of their family, you can now start talking to consumers about pets as part of their family. You can create different products, you can create a different positioning on the market by referring to pets as a family member. So that's a transformational way of using you know, insights and using data to create insights. And it's important because most people talk about what I call baseline. And the baseline is you can describe what, hap what, what happened by using data, you can predict what's going to happen, there's a lot of predictive analytics, and then you can prescribe. You can choose from the predictions you have available the best one based on what you want to optimize. But this idea of using data and analytics to inspire, which is how I translate what you ask me, it's an extremely difficult thing. And using data to inspire requires brains, not necessarily left and right but just brains. And I think that's extremely difficult in our industry, people who understand both spaces and they can be business people, data people, analytics people, technology people. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's not easy to hire these unicorns, basically. These people who can play very well, seamlessly move between left and right, uh, we, we have a very open way of looking for this type of talent. We don't look for a specific background. We obviously look for people, for people who understand data and understand analytics. So there's a couple of things we do. Number one is diversity and variety. So we go for people from different type of backgrounds, different type of industries. And number two is we hire, we have a program where we bring in recent graduates into our team and we develop talent. We develop talent by exposing that team to multidisciplinary teams, creative people, strategy people, planners, technologists. So as part of the development process, they get exposed to everything else that has to interconnect. The other thing we do is we don't just train the analysts. We have to train everybody else who interacts with the analyst. 
And part of that training is helping people realize that analytics is a two-step process. Obviously, the easy one to define is you have to solve a problem. The first part of that is you have to define a problem. And if you basically set up that first part as everybody's responsibility of defining the problem, not just the analytics people, but creative people, strategy people, planners, have a role in analytics and they see themselves as part of this process, then you have a common ground between analytics people and everybody else that you can use to create knowledge. So we go in by not just trying to hire the best people for analytics, but then looking at the entire ecosystem and hiring people on the creative side and on the strategy side and on the planning side that also understand data. You cannot just do it by looking at your own silo. You have to look at it as a holistic ecosystem because we work as part of a holistic, multidisciplinary ecosystem. I think it's extremely important. And, you know, it starts by how the analytics role, the domain of analytics, analytics is placed in the organization. Uh, it starts by having the CEO, CAO as part of the executive team uh, because that sets the uh, visibility and the focus in the organization from the C-suite down. So I would say it, it's definitely the commitment um, and uh, the active sponsorship, uh, not just you know, support, because you can say I support analytics, but then you don't create the right structures in the organization, you don't create the, uh, the right focus, and you don't allow the autonomy to use experimentation, data to drive decisioning. Could you succeed if you don't have support from uh, senior leadership? And my answer to that is no. Uh, you need to create an organization that reflects the commitment of the senior team especially the executive team. So you can't have an organization that says, I support uh, analytics as a key component of driving decisioning uh, and being a key element of how we do business and then not including the CAO on the leadership team. Or you can't say, you know, data is driving our decisioning, but then not own any data or not having a process of procuring data. So as an, you know, as an executive team, I think it's important to show with actions the commitment to data and analytics because there is definitely a lot of hype. Uh, a lot of organizations are looking at analytics and data as an accelerator, but then you see the reality is, when you look at Gartner, only 15% of organizations are using data and analytics to create sustainable competitive advantage. Well, what's happening to the other 85%? And we're talking about you know, Fortune 500 companies. Is it because there is hype and there is no results, so leadership gets you know, disconnected from the reality? Is it because it's too difficult? You know, we talked about talent. I think talent is extremely important. Or is it because you know, it's hard to help people visualize the benefit of analytics? My perspective is all three things together. It's hard to get analytics to the hands of everybody because people forget the need to create tools and applications to bring complex analytics to the front line. Talent is a big problem because people who understand both business and analytics and can explain and do the connection, very hard to find, you know, the so-called unicorns. And then third is the executive, the leadership team in many organizations, uh, because they haven't seen quick results, they are disenfranchised by the role of analytics and the impact they can have. So. This, this idea of um, quick wins and long-term gains, I think, is an important one because it brings me back to the need for having a plan. Uh, you know, if you look at the strategic planning, it's a relatively you know new phenomenon. If you go back, uh, you know, uh, a couple of years, it wasn't something that everybody used to do. But once it started becoming common practice, and everybody saw the outcome of strategic planning you realize that you know you can't go without it. The same principle applies for data and analytics. You need a plan. 
and you need to start with a plan that has both quick wins so that you can bring credibility and results, but also is a longer term plan that allows you to make decisions around are you going to invest in buying versus developing your own capabilities? Are you going to uh, hire talent and create centralized teams or are you going to decentralize? So these very big strategic decisions are part of having a plan. So I think a lot of organizations, they jump into the data, they jump into doing analytics without having a long-term plan. So my perspective is if you want to be successful, start with a plan. Don't start with the data. Don't start with the analytics. And I think that's a gap. We've seen it both in our industry and we also have seen it in our clients, where the first thing you want, they want to do is they want to impact a very short-term outcome, but they don't try to connect everything into a longer-term a use of data and analytics in the organization as a, a, as a way of making decisions on a day-to-day -day basis. I think it's a, the way that the, data and analytics changing how companies market themselves. I think, it's, I, I think of it, it's two ways. I think how companies are marketing to people is changing data, and data is changing how companies are marketing to people. Because both activities generate more volume and more velocity and more complexity in, in data. Um, as more consumers create expectations that now go across categories, and now everybody has to compete on the best possible experience, regardless of the category. So in the past, if you were a bank, you were competing with other banks, so everybody was doing bad, so it was okay. Now if you're a bank, you're competing with Amazon. So if Amazon delivers things to me in two days, or in two hours, or in 20 minutes, and I'm buying something that costs $50, when I have an investment or when I buy a life insurance product through my bank or an investment, make an investment, I want to know how everything is going on a minute by minute because I'm making hundreds of thousands of dollars of um, product purchasing. So that leveling of expectations regardless of categories and the rise to the top to own that experience is basically transforming the use of data in and, and analytics in, in the marketplace. And I also think it it, it helps create uh, differentiation in industries that, in essence, are commodified. So if you look at a checking account, if you look at an insurance product, in many ways uh, there is a lot of retail products that they're commodified. It allows you to create more personalization and more differentiation. Data allows you to create more personalization and differentiation and drive emotional connections between your uh, uh, customers in your brand uh, that eventually leads to a sustainable competitive uh, advantage, which you couldn't have if your customers see you as a commodity, if they can change you tomorrow because you have no connection to them as an individual. The whole area of what I would call social CRM. It's a tremendous opportunity for, for companies, especially as we can more frequently than ever connect social conversations, not just from the perspective of understanding what are the major topics and major areas that people are talking about, but also connect those conversations to specific customers, specific individuals, so then we can understand them, we can better see and predict their behaviors and needs, and we can go target them in the entire digital ecosystem. So if you're an airline, as an example, and you have the ability to listen to what your customers are saying, even in the complaints area, and you understand because you can match the people who are talking about you to your database and identify who are your most valuable customers, and then see how those people are complaining and what they're complaining about versus everybody else. When you change the way you are organizing your resolution of those issues and where you're investing dollars to actually solve those problems for your most profitable customers. So that type of understanding from a consumer insights perspective is extremely important. But then it translates into targeting. After you make that change, when you're trying to find out more of those people and talk to them about the changes you made so that you can create a better experience and understanding and connection with the brand, of course you can because you can connect. So. I think there is two opportunities. One is in the insights area, and the other one is in the area of social CRM. And we have been doing work with our clients in both of those areas with great success. I 
mean, there is, there is definitely, we're doing a lot of work right now in machine learning, AI, uh, we, in, in social, naturally, you use a lot of language processing. So I think this is areas we are trying to do more work, create more case studies, and prove value for the complexity that they bring into the business and for the black box solutions that naturally create. Uh, I think it's more interesting for me on establishing a process of continually and constantly evaluating the offering on the market versus the individual solution. So what we have done at Wonderman is that we have created a process that actually looks at everything that exists on the market that could be relevant for us and for our clients. And we continuously evaluate. Since we are agnostic on what drives value for our clients, we'll go in and partner with major tool providers. We actually have a process of doing that. So we evaluate every quarter 30 to 40 needs providers on you know, data, specific technologies that solve very needs problems, on new reporting methodologies, and BI tools, and social tools. And then we do a, a formal evaluation process, and we have that IP that we can bring to our clients. So when a client comes to us and say, have you ever worked with X? We go back to our database, we have done an evaluation, we can help them. I think having a process like that, where you can scan the market, and evaluate and then create IP that you can transfer to your clients, it's, it's extremely important. So I think for me that's one component. And then, you know, as we discussed the areas of machine learning, you know, continuing the work we're doing there, um, and um, uh, AI, I think they're going to be extremely important. Now, from a data perspective, uh, what drives, I think, and what will continue to drive innovation is this ability to connect the digital and physical worlds together. Uh, as more and more uh, capabilities um, of doing that become available, you'll get to activate more marketing innovation, not just about location, but about how physically someone reacts to the weather, to where they are in the space, and what it means for a brand. So when everything becomes interconnected, from your clothing to your location, to the weather, to you know the economy, general things that in the past were very hard to actually put together and organize, you'll have as a marketeer the ability to use that information to activate it for your brand. I think that's where the opportunity is going to be, to be able to understand those connections and use them effectively for what you're trying to achieve. I think it's interesting because if you are an advertiser like us, if you are a, a provider like us, because we do have, you know, 400 clients, we have the capacity and the skill to do that. But if you are one client trying to look at all this noise on the market, it takes a lot of time. And I think the arbitration between value and time, um, it's not there. Now, surprisingly, this is one area that our clients under leverage us. And I always go to our partners and say, ask us to give you information about what's on the market, what's best on the market, because we have done the work. So you can get the information you need. You know, I was in discussion with one of my clients who's here with me today, and she was looking for a reporting tool. So she said, you know, I'm looking between Spotify, Domo, and Tableau. I said, don't worry about it. We've done the research, we've done the evaluation, we can give you the results back. You don't have to spend the time talking to any of these vendors. And we're agnostic, we don't care where are we going to get your value? We want you to get the most value. So I think that's a really underutilized uh, uh, area for a lot of uh, clients. I think the sweet spot of CAOs is they need to be able to understand data and data structures and marketing technology. I'm in the marketing area, so I would say marketing technology. So that's one area. They need to be able to understand how all those things work in decisioning and evangelize the need of the use of data and technology to make better decisions. And lastly, they need to be very familiar on how to transform the organization. As a lot of our clients and a lot of companies out there are going through a transformation of becoming more digital and fitting into the entire ecosystem between their suppliers, their new customers, and the new way of doing business. So having the ability to understand technology and data as assets, being able to use that to make better decisions, 
and finally being able to transform the organization knowing fundamental transformational principles so that you can help move organization into that journey because it's not an, uh, it's, it's an evolution of moving from where you are to being more data driven, more digitally uh, relevant uh, and um, you know making better decisions. That's, I think, the sweet spot of, of the role, owning all these three areas and playing in this sweet spot.